Mike Hayes, Holy Cross Class of 1993, is a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Navy SEALs. Having served throughout South America, Europe, the Middle East, and Central Asia, including the conflicts in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and earning bronze stars for valor in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was also awarded the Defense Superior Service Medal from the White House. In the Navy, he rose to important leadership posts, including Deputy Commander for All Special Operations in Amber Province, Iraq, and Commanding Officer of SEAL Team 2, which included 10 months as commander of a 2,000-person Special Operations Task Force in the southern eastern Afghanistan. As a White House Fellow from 2008 to 2009, he served in the administrations of both George W. Bush and Barack Obama as Director, Defense Policy and Strategy at the National Security Council. In this role, Hayes produced a new proposed START treaty and conducted negotiations with the Russians in Moscow. He also led the White House response to President Obama's first major foreign policy showdown, the hijacking of the Maersk, Alabama, off the coast of Somalia. In the private sector, Mike served as chief of staff to the CEO and chief operating officer roles at Bridgewater Associates. He currently serves as senior vice president and head of strategic operations and helps run Cognizant Technology, a 270,000 person Fortune 200 global IT services firm. Mike is a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations and is on the board of directors of the National Medal of Honor Museum. But he says the thing he's proudest of is his time on the Hill and his association with Holy Cross. In spring of 2018, Mike came back to the Hill to share his insights about how a Jesuit education prepared him to demonstrate and teach excellence leadership. If you would just uh, join me in welcoming my case. Well, th thank you, Daniel. Thanks for the um, overly kind introduction. The real honor is is spending time with with people like you. It's uh, let's start with really congratulating each of you. It's very easy to be on the hill and kind of in the routine uh, of the academic year and kind of lose sight of the fact that you know back uh, three or four years ago. Each of you were chosen in a very competitive process to even land on the hill, and it's a real, it's a, it's, it's hard to understand the depth of the uh, of that accomplishment. And I can tell you, as having had my 25th reunion this past summer, I promise you that you really won't fully understand and appreciate the foundation that the hill does and, and creates for you until you. Uh, do have some time pass between you and being here. It's very easy to get caught up in the day to day, but this is a, a really special place. I think it's 174 acres, if, if uh, memory serves me right, and these 174 acres are, are some of the best in the nation and the world. So, and that's not just because of the land, it's because of the people that are here. So, um, you know, like Daniel said, there's a, a, a appreciate the introduction. I've had the, the great fortune and sometimes misfortune of, of several things in life, whether it's, you know, running you know, strategic or, or crises types of meetings in the White House Situation Room, which I've done hundreds of times, or, or um, leading organizations in the SEALs and in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera. I've been, you know, really I'm passionate about sharing what I've learned with others. And so days like today are, are really special. So thank you for your time. The, um, the place I would start is really like Daniel and Maura said, hey, Mike, can you, can you just talk about what's success? You know, small questions like world peace, how, you know, how to cure cancer, things like that. And they gave me 20 minutes to do it. So I thought, wow, this is a, a pretty easy task. And I thought I would start with my best advice first. And I just really remember two sayings from college. Number one is, it's only a lot of reading if you do it. <laughs> and number two is, if you leave it to the last minute, it only takes you a minute to do. So um, that, that's pretty much how I lived my academic career. Don't pull my transcript, and I hope Dean Freegie does not watch this, uh, this ever in the future. I'll be in real trouble and uh, maybe get my diploma yanked and, uh, and, and overturned. But uh, you know, in, in all honesty, I was a very average student at Holy Cross. I was a very, I, I was not, you can listen to what I've done in life and say, wow, that guy must have been born with great, you know, leadership skills or this or that or the other thing. Absolutely false. You know, all I was born with was a determination and a work ethic and get, having great fortune about being in places that are so formative like, like the hill here. 
And so, you know, the, uh, the point is that, you know, you can really become anything and do anything no matter where you are in life. If you're, you know, 20 or 21 and getting ready to graduate or you're 95 and you still got another decade that you're, you're wanting to still accomplish things. Um, in all seriousness, I have done a lot of thinking about what is success? What does success mean? What is impact? The, the Jesuit liberal arts education is a very special thing. Now, the, the, whole, the world sometimes doesn't know how to figure out a liberal arts education. What in the world is it? You take a little of this, a little of that, and you don't come out as a subject matter expert in anything. What I will tell you is that that actually doesn't matter. And 100 times out of 100, I would take the Jesuit liberal arts education, and I'm going to tell you a few reasons why and weave it through a few things that we'll talk about today. The, the elemental reason is because it serves as a great foundation. And the foundation is way more than anything you'll learn. I guarantee you in five years, you will never remember any one thing that you learned on campus. What you will remember is how to learn and, and how you synthesize information, how you connect dots, how do you, how do you um, come up with you know, angles of approach on different life situations. And the professional workspace is so different than the classroom as you all can sit there and you've had tastes of it, whether it's internships or, or, or various um, professional experiences during the summers. But, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, there's really, I believe, three things that help people be successful. And so let's just jump into those three and then uh, we'll get practical as well. So a little bit theoretical, but number one, I deeply believe that success is, um, is based on being an excellent person. And what does that mean? I would say it starts with this. Excellent people are only excellent if they know they're never excellent enough. You have to have that deep humility to know that you're never good enough. Sure, you can be really good, but don't focus on, on what's good. Focus on how you can be better. We all, everybody in this room has different talents, diverse talents, strengths, great at things. But how do you wake up and say, I, I have that hunger, drive, and desire to be better? Whether it's to go deeper in something you know, or to diversify and do something totally different. But that hunger to be more excellent is, is one of the three determinants in my, my view of, of success. The second one is being oriented more for others than self. Might sound a lot like the Jesuit motto, right? People for others. It really is the truth. I will uh, come back to this in a second, but I assure you that if in the universe you focus more on giving than taking, you will not only have more impact, but ironically, and this isn't the goal, but it'll come back to you a hundredfold. We'll talk more about that in a second. The third thing is being objective and reflective about yourself. In other words, after you've done things right or wrong, do you spend the time to think about what you did right, what you did wrong, what you could have done better? If you don't spend that time, whatever happens in the future is going to be random. So when you have these experiences out in life, if you can step back and think about, would I do the same thing again? What would I do differently? What did I learn? Et cetera. You don't learn, An inertia, inertia will keep the great things going great. It takes an exogenous force for the bad things to change. So if you, need, if you want to do something better, you need to think about what that is and then take action to, to improve in that. So that, that kind of leads me to what I would say are, are really, what I'll give you is five real, a little bit more practical kind of lessons. And I'm really looking forward to the you know, Q&A and turning this into a dialogue because that's where it gets a lot more fun. Um, I'm not in the habit of, of speaking at people, although my, my wife and daughter might disagree, but uh, uh, th this, is, uh, this is intended to be a great back and forth session and we'll get there. But, uh, but you know, five things. Number one is that life is all about relationships. People can, let's take the, the, the word networking. Let's think of a networking event. People think about networking events as going to something where there are people who are more accomplished than they are who they can get something from. That's not a network. A network is a group of people in whom you invest. And when you invest in people, when you need nothing in return, you've ingest, invested a bunch of energy into a group of people, I assure you when you need something, that wonderful group of people in whom you've invested will return that and help you with whatever you need. So if you really flip that and you think about life, again, as what you give to a group of people, you will ironically, uh, actually not so ironically, receive when you need it in your times of toughness because we all have hard days. 
You know, I, I've, uh, one thing that, that I didn't say in the beginning was, look, I've lived the highs and the lows of everything that our nation has done in, in combat. I've, I've buried, you know, I would say dozens, but it's uh, over 40 friends, some of them as close as my brother. And, uh, and my brother and I are very close. The, you know, and so as you think about um, what to, how to approach life, I believe there are two kinds of people. There are beers and there are doers. The beer loves the title, loves the, loves the shine, loves the spotlight. The doer actually does the work. Now, when I say does the work, that's meaning getting things done. Let's talk about that for a second. There are different types of roles and responsibilities and things that you can go out and do in life. Some of them are you know, really high level and you can impact things you know, a half of a percent and impact 325 million Americans. Or you could you know, really go deep. I was in the Big Brother program here on campus. You know, there was a, a seven or eight year old that I was a you know, Big Brother to. You take one life and you really go deep and you really help out. And there are points in between. So you make choices about how do you give and what, what do you give. But I promise you that at the end of the day, the people who are oriented to move toward problems and, and, and get into people's business and when they need help are the people who will, will be more successful in the long run. Number two, differences don't matter. Resol how things get resolved does. What do I mean by that? Look, we're all gonna have differences in life. We're gonna have different viewpoints. Most of us like to just figure out how can the world understand me better? But if you live a life of trying to understand the rest of the world and understand that there are multiple viewpoints, there will, oh, there's no right and there's no wrong. There are just different viewpoints. And so in life, how do you have a process that can reconcile different viewpoints? Uh, let's do a quick thought exercise just in your own heads. Think of the policy position that you feel strongest about whether it's you know, taxation and income redistribution, or abortion, or you, know, you name your hot button issue, and what do you feel strongest about out in life? If you have trouble thinking about that right now, then I would encourage you to really think about what do you care about, but that's a different, that's a different uh, topic. But the, the, um, when you think about the position that you feel str most strongly about, now think about the opposite position. Is that position wrong? A lot of people think it's wrong. It's not wrong, it's different. So how do we as a nation, which ultimately boils down to two citizens, how do two citizens, two people, family members, friends, or people who've never met who have different positions, how do you reconcile differences and how do you step above that so that you can have a good process in order to, to, um, to live with whatever decision gets made? And so we often tend to think about the, the um, winners and losers in a zero-sum game. But you, you know, when, when we don't get our way and we, you know, if you think about presidential politics and, and not to get too political here, but let's just keep it party agnostic. But half the country is almost always in disagreement with the set of policies that whatever administration is in power is, is, is pushing on the nation. Our four, founding fathers made this nation uh, in a way that zigzags its way down the highway we never, we hopefully never really go off the road. You could argue we're getting close these days, but we never really get off the highway. But the, um, but you know, we bounce, we zig and we zag, so we ultimately get where we're going. And so policies will come and go, but what doesn't come and go are the relationships and the how, how we, how we reconcile our differences. So while I'm talking about big picture policy in DC, it comes to the local disagreement in your, you know, in in whatever your local, um, you know, your town, your your business that you're in, or your family, whatever that is. So settle, how to settle differences and how conflict resolution is an interesting thing. Each of these topics, we only have 20 minutes, so I, I honestly would love to do a deep dive in any of these. So whenever, you know, think about your questions and we'll come back and I'm glad to share more on any of these topics. But number three is becoming comfortable with discomfort. Comfort with discomfort. It is so critical to growth. You know, by definition, if you're comfortable, you're not going to be growing. You're not learning new things. It's discomfort that makes you learn. In Navy SEAL training, you know, my class started with 120 people. 19 graduated. 
Now, my senior year, so I, I didn't know I wanted to be a SEAL until after I did the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, that week long of, of having to be quiet in Narragansett, Rhode Island, which now we have the, 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 local, um, the local place, which, um, which we don't need to go to Narragansett anymore. But I spent a week being quiet, talking to nobody, which if you, as you get to know me, you'll figure out is not my personality. And so uh, thinking about who do you want to be, how do you want to be with the world, et cetera. Well, I went from the Hill to SEAL training. And in Navy SEAL training, we are very good at making students get out of their comfort zone. I say students because that's like the, the trainees. You know, if you think about life, you're 99% you, you're of the time, you're in 68 degree rooms, you're fed, your clothes are dry, life is great. That's not what defines life. What defines life is the ability to stretch out beyond that 99% of the time. And in SEAL training, we stretch people, they'll have limits, and we'll stretch people beyond their limits. So what people think is their limits in their head, they actually learn is are, they're not their limits. And when you stretch people beyond what they think is possible, people get wobbly. People get wobbly, it gets hard. So then in that case, there are, there are two kinds of people. There are people who embrace that and just say, and take it in and just um, and be, they're able to kind of look at the horizon and think big picture and think about others and maintaining their morals and their ethics and how they communicate with people when things get really challenging. And there are people who don't. We don't want or take the people who don't. And so as you get beyond your limits, not only do you realize that your limits are actually further than they than you thought they were. More importantly, you learn how to live when you're at the edges. And so, look, I've been at the edge of human misery many, many times in my life. I've been in, you know, crazy cold water for hours and hours on end, or, you know, I could go on and tell you a hundred different things that I've done in the SEALs, which stretch the, the, what, um, what normal people think of as p p possible for the human body, but more importantly, the human mind. And I'm telling you that it is capable of so much more than you're thinking of, but in order to figure that out, you have to get out of your comfort zone. So the, the corollary is you're th sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, but I'm on Mount St. James, I'm in academic classroom. That statement applies to anything you're doing. Getting out of your comfort zone is, you know, taking that art class when you're more of a math major, or except for our friend who is, you know, t majoring in both. But the, uh, the um, you know, take, pushing yourself in directions that you don't normally go. When you pick up the newspaper, we all gravitate to whatever we like most, the front page, the sports, or whatever it is that you pick up. Think about the section of the paper that you never read, that you always gloss over. Well, why not lean into that? Why not lean into that part that you gloss over? Just a thought. In the newspaper, there is a metaphor for life. It's not just the newspaper that I'm talking about. So again, uh, push yourself. And, and be comfortable with discomfort because that's where the learning is. The, um, the next point though is you, you could, um, I'll just tell you, it's outcome-based thinking. Think about what you want first, what's the desired outcome, and then how do you get there? A lot of people think about how to get somewhere and then where they're going. One of my econ professors in grad school reminded me, be, be, beware of fast trains to the wrong station. That statement has always stuck with me. Yeah, I've been on, sometimes you feel like you're on that fast train, but you stop and you go, wait a minute, but where are we going? Outcome-based thinking. Another example, it, we, we love to hold up, out, we Americans, love to hold up outputs as work. You know, how many hours did you spend studying or what did you get on the exam? The number of hours you spend studying doesn't matter. What matters is what you learn. Are you learning? That's the outcome. You could argue that what did you get on the test is the outcome, and I would also tell you that probably doesn't matter. What matters is what you learned, and did you do your best, and did you live the life of values and, and, and character that you have. Um, so I joke around in the SEALs, I say the L stands for lazy. But I actually, there's something there for real. SEALs are some of the, most, the hardest working, most dedicated people you'll find on the planet. And for real, we find the laziest path to the goal. Why? Because the faster and the easier we can get to our goal, the more we can spend time doing something else, doing our next mission or our next, or resting. Go back to econ, we were talking about that earlier. Life is just two things. It's work and leisure. It's a capital W or a capital L. So if you can work more efficiently and productively, 
You get to choose whether you can work, you work more or you have more leisure, but it's your choice. So think about the outcome you want and then the fastest path of the goal. Not that, like, not, not the circuitous way to get there that takes 3x or 30x or 300x longer to do what you're trying to do. So the, um, let me pause on that. We can talk about, I have more on this in Q&A if you want to, I'm sensitive to sticking to our 20 minutes. The next thing is to only assume risk that's worth assuming. Think about as you're making moves, now this can, when you're gonna do something next, there's always risk in what we do. Whether we're driving on the highway or a career move we're gonna make, where, what internship are you gonna do? What's your first big career move gonna be? Um, but uh, in the SEALs, to, to take the analogy pretty far, admittedly, is an operation that we're gonna go on. There's always risk. So I think about things from the top down and the bottom up and, you, and the two have to meet somehow. You have to be able to reconcile it. You need a framework-based thinking. And so you have, what's the strategy? What's the, what's the thing we're trying to accomplish? What's our outcome like we were talking earlier? What's, what's the, um, the strategy is how you're gonna get there. The, the execution is the actual path. You know, and so as you think about um, pulling the entire system together, then you know, you're going to need to take risk. I'll talk in a minute about how to, how to think about next steps in career and things like that in a second. But, the, um, but we all have blind spots. And so you can think you know that there's risk around the corner, but the most important thing is understanding that you can't see everything. You know, and so in the professional workspace, like right now we're thinking about buying a really big, really large company, and, um, and you know, there's risk associated with a purchase. Is the use of shareholders capital going to be a, the highest ROI? You know, if you're a CEO of a company, you only have a couple of choices on how to, sp you're ultimately an investor. You're doing with your, whatever free cash flow you're producing, you're either buying back shares, you're buying down your debt, returning capital to shareholders, or you're investing it either in your business or into another business that you're buying all or part of and bringing it into your business and trying to achieve some synergies so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Those are your choices if you're running a business, right? And so if you think about, Every one of those steps, you have, you have just four or five basic steps. One of those four or five things is the best thing for shareholders. And so if you think about your fiduciary responsibility when you're running a, a business, you have to try to get to the best one of those. So then how do you get there? Go back to the thing I said before about process. Well, if you're running a process, if I, if I made that decision alone about whether to do what, one of those four or five things, I would probably not come to the best decision. There are people who are always smarter than me. There are people who know more about everything out there in life. And so when people ask me like, who am I or what do I do? I describe myself as not playing an instrument. I conduct bands. My comparative advantage is conducting bands. I can always find you a better instrument player of every instrument. And, and that's not a value judgment. There's no brag or anything in there. It can sound arrogant. It's not intended to be at all. I just know that there are, I'm really genuinely not as good at many, many people at many of the components of, of the things that are necessary. And so how do you, but how do you harness that? How do you A, find the best people, B, bring them in and, and into the process and get their voice into the process and, um, and get into the blind spots, the unknown, unknown quadrant. How do you pull that in? And in the, the, the way is culture and being able to make people comfortable for speaking up. You know, I just gave you a business uh, case kind of scenario in the SEALs, imagine a really hard operation. In 2000, I don't know, 10 or 11, we were looking at going into this, this village where Taliban were repressing you know, young girls from being able to go to school and a bunch of other way worse things that, that, uh, that you would not, they're just reprehensible. And there were a lot of bad people that were always gonna be bad people and, and they needed to be, um, be uh, removed from the situation so that they could not do bad things to great people. And so, you know, we had, you know, 30 or 40 SEALs thinking about a certain way to go do an operation. And so it, it's, uh, you know, we're in our cycle going out night after night. I'm responsible for the whole team. And, you know, if you left the decision to me of like, hey, how are, Mike, go create the operation and go run it however you want. We probably, I can almost guarantee you, we would not have done as well as, as the difference, which is, hey, Mike, go oversee a process that gets to the best way to do the operation. Well, now you harness the energy and the ideas of the entire 30 or 40 or 50 SEALs. 
and they say, hey, we should do the X, we should do Y, we should do Z. How about this? How do you mitigate away risk? And these are the same kinds of things that you think through so that you land on, a, uh, on the best possible decision. I like to say leaders don't need to make the best decision. Leaders need to make sure the best decision gets made. And there's a real difference between those two. Um, so, a lot there. The, um, the next thing I would tell you is, don't learn what to think, learn how to think. Okay. What I really, when I'm running a SEAL team, I, you know, I don't want people to, to, to learn, when I'm in situation X, I always do Y. That's not, that's not what we need. We need people to say, I'm in situation X, here are the characteristics and the, 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 the atmospherics and what's happening in and around me, and then here's how I weigh the things together, and, and, and um, here are the things to think about, and so that led me to do Z. So after an operation in the SEALs, we don't talk about what went well, we talk about what didn't go well. Again, because of that inertia point that I made earlier. But the highest return on the investment of your time is by talking about what didn't go well. And, and it doesn't do any good for some you know, young SEAL to come out and say, I, I came out of the building and I zigged left and then I zigged right and then I zagged. Well, you know what? You're gonna have a totally different set of situations the next operation you're on and the one after that, you'll never be in the same situation twice. So it doesn't matter the zig and the zag in that case. The conversation needs to go deeper and say, well, why did you zig? Why did you zag? And understand how did you think about zigging and how did you think about zagging? And so as a leader of an organization, look, if you wanna create scale, you can't, you can't tell people whether to zig or zag. You need to teach people how to think about zigging or zagging. I know it's, I just make, as you can see, I'm not prepared at all. I'm just kind of winging it, guys. But the zigging and the zagging is a very professional description. The, um, Anyways, teaching people how to think, not what to think. And then when you think about scaling your organization, when you're running something, and I know you're sitting there thinking, hey, come on, I'm not running anything, I'm in college, I'm not like the, in a 270,000 person organization. I promise you, you will be, if you want to. You will be the best instrument player if you wanna play an instrument. You'll be the best band leader if you wanna play a band, be the band leader. You'll do whatever you want, why? Because you have the foundation of a Jesuit liberal arts education, which enables you to do whatever your mind sets you, sets, uh, decides to do. Um, so the, um, I have a few other points, but I think we're running a little bit toward the 20 minutes right now. The, um, the thing that I would kind of close with is to go, to say, well, what is it about the, the hill and the found, you're talking about this foundation in the, the Jesuit liberal arts education. If you tie back to the things that I'm talking about, like leaning into the, the things you wouldn't normally do, thinking about taking risk, thinking about the outcome-based thinking, you're getting ready to make decisions on what are you gonna do in life? How do you go try things on without, how do you try and not buy you know, along the way? How do you, you know, Mora's got a, a wonderful program and how do you, how do you um, test what you may like? You know, when people give you advice, the irony is that they're basically telling you implicitly that you should do what they did because they're so smart. I'm not excluded from that. I could sit here and give you, a, I could tell you what I think you should do and, and I would bake in my own biases on what I think is important. And so as you're listening to people like me, uh, you know, take it in and say, hey, some of what Mike said is, is great, some is terrible. What do I want to take and put in my toolkit? What do I disagree with? But it's all progress and it's all great because you learn where you stand on issues and what you think. But the, the thing to be aware of is that as you get career advice, it will be biased. And I've thought a lot about this, and I actually will really quickly run you through a practical way to think about making decisions, okay? This is a, this is a framework for a framework. Therefore, you're gonna create the framework, and it's gonna be your own wants and desires and your own outcomes that you want in order to think this through. But um, going back to the outcome-based thinking, you don't, you're not expected to say, hey, here's exactly what I wanna do in life. You, know, the, um, you could say, okay, I really want law school. You, know, you could go be a great lawyer, pass the bar, do three years of real lawyering, and then get into policy. No decision you make is for, has to be forever. It can be, but my, I would tell you there are three phases of a career. This is 
my parlance, I know I've never heard this anywhere else, so it it's, could be right, could be wrong. This is my, how I think about it. Three phases of a career. The first phase is really fundamentally learning what something, becoming an expert at the thing that you choose. Doctor, lawyer, accountant, Navy SEAL, whatever it is. Learn your trade very well. Build a foundation of something. The second phase, and there's no timing associated with this. These are just different people move through these phases at different times. But the second phase is when you start to think, hey, I kind of know this thing pretty well. I want to now prove to the world that I know my trade pretty well. You know, you need your name up in lights, you need recognition, you need to be in the meeting and be turned to and say, what do you think? You know, and you really want to establish the dominance that you're really an expert in your field. So it's great if you make it to that second stage. A lot of people never make it there. They're never the person who is consulted or asked or who does the leading, et cetera. But the ultimate thing is the third stage. The third stage is when you're so comfortable that you are the best at what you do, that you no longer need to prove it to anybody. When you get there, that's when you're totally liberated because you're so comfortable that you're fine making mistakes. As long as you adhere to your morals and your ethics and your standards and you do what's right and you live a life of values, there's no mistake that will derail you. There's only mistakes that you'll learn from. Try the hardest things that you can do. You'll either succeed or fail. If you succeed, great. If you fail, you either learn or you don't. If you learn, that's success. If you don't, that's failure. So the only way you fail is if you try something, you fail and you don't learn. Okay, so back to that third phase. That's when you're really liberated. You're comfortable standing in front of groups and saying, I don't know, or I made a mistake, or you know the, the classic ego-related things that don't allow people to come off of their, their pu public position. That is really, really not just harmful, but can be poisonous for getting to the best outcomes. So I really encourage you to kind of think through you know, those, the, the, the first step in that, which is get really good at something. And if you pick the wrong thing, that's okay. You know, that's, that's no problem. The, um, so once you've picked your thing and you're, you're, you're thinking, how do, I, how do I make decisions like this? Here's a quick framework for a framework. Think about the conceptual buckets of what makes you happy. At the end of the day, we are, we are simple beings who are motivated by very, very elemental basic things. If we went to a whiteboard and gamed it out, we could probably name 10 things and they, in, in summary, motivate roughly 99.7% of the, of the world. It's, um, it's quality of life, it's learning, it's um, public recognition, it's impact, it's compensation. Um, you know, there's five things right there. You get my point. Uh, promotion is another one. You know, like, are, are you moving up and becoming more and more in the world? But if, you, if we got to 10 things, we'd capture the majority of what motivates people. So know what motivates you and be honest with yourself. You don't even need to say it out loud. So don't lie to yourself. You know, just know who you are. We all have strengths and we all have different things that motivate us. And the art of leadership is really finding out what motivates the various people in your organization and using those levers to achieve a common goal. And then inversely, there are things that trigger people, things that people hate, like close management. Some people want somebody right over their shoulder and a damn life coach. Other people want managers to be nowhere near them and just be totally autonomous and points in between. So know your people that are, that are around you, seniors, peers, and subordinates, it doesn't matter, but know who's around you, know what, the people, what people like, and then use those, those levers and um, triggers, if you will, to achieve the common good. The, um, so we, if you're honest with yourself about what motivates you, now you can, you can apply the framework that I'll tell you. Think about the conceptual buckets of things that could make up a great job. Think about, I'll just name some, I've got these written down, I've sent these in email, I can send them to you guys afterwards, but think about uh, your next move, think geography, sector, size of organization, quality of your people you're around, um, opportunity to move in your organization, um, compensation, I don't know if I said geography, um, think about um, positive impact in the world, think about um, optionality, does your next move give you more options after that or does it narrow your options? You know, a friend that went and traded palladium at Goldman, great, great job, well paid, 
you know, you're not going to go trade palladium and become an expert in that for seven years and then have lots of options after that. You know, think about are you narrowing or are you expanding your options? And there's no value judgment on the, my friend who's a palladium trader. He's doing what he lo loves. No problem. But be conscious of, of knowing what move you're making. Um, so think about these buckets. And when you get roughly to the point where you're naming things that you think you might not actually care about, that's when your exercise is mostly complete. You've got the 10 or 15 buckets listed out. And now take them all one by one and think about each independent, each of the variables is independent and give it a score of one to 100 of how important it is to you. And now put, then put, once you've done that for all of the variables, let's just take geography and compensation. You know, if you could have the million dollar a year job in the city that you never wanted to live in or the hundred thousand dollar a year job in the city you always wanted to live in, which would you pick? Your force ranking should answer that question for you. You know, so if you go back to that map of what you're looking for, you've just created a framework for yourself so that no alum or some random person like me is biasing you with what you think. You've now created your own map. And then you're gonna have options that come up. Take the options that come up and compare them to your map. And say, hey, how does it compare? All you're doing is solving a multivariable equation there. It's pretty simple. But you know, nobody here I think has probably bought a house yet, but I'm relatively certain your parents have. Think about when they went through the exercise to buy a house. There's no perfect house purchase. You always want one more bedroom. You either want the pool or the better school district. And there are things that you get that you don't want and things you want that you don't get. But you have 10 houses you can pick. Which, which, what's the logic you use to apply to, to pick the house that you picked? It's not unlike this map and this job process that I'm telling you. You won't get everything. But then how do you, how do you populate your options so that you have options to compare back to your map? Okay, and now you can sit there and say, yeah, but I just don't know what's out there in the universe. How do I generate options like that? Well, you start with developing your elevator speech. When you get that force ranking together, you get your five or eight sentences together and say to somebody like me, hey, Mike, I really am looking to get into somewhere in the um, life sciences field, love to live in Denver, and, um, and, and really prefer a really large organization over some small little startup. Okay, now somebody like me who hears your, hears your pitch can think about like, oh, I know somebody you should talk to. See, this is top-down thinking. The bottom-up thinking is, hey, let me just go talk to a bunch of alumni, and as soon as I find something that sounds halfway decent, I'm gonna go jump on that. That is not a process. That's a, well, it's a bottom-up process. It's a terrible process because you're gonna to react to whatever randomly hits you. So if you think of yourself as building a funnel, the one thing you land on next is gonna be a function of what comes into your funnel. You know, and so if you just have conversations with people in San Diego, the chances of you landing in a job in San Diego are, are way higher than being in, in Boston. You know, and so think about the conversations that you have. If you just talk to people who are in finance and you think you're gonna end up in life sciences, you know, do your thinking about what conversations you're having at the front end of your funnel. Think about what logic you're gonna apply in order to rule things in and out and explore them and the process, the process by which you're gonna help get in your own blind spots and learn more about what your options are and then la ultimately land on something. So that's my quick advice on kind of a framework for a framework. I'm very glad to talk more about this over lunch. I recognize, I, man, when I was your age, I had no idea what I was gonna do. I was very much the, the average student that went up to the Heart Center and you know, me and the pull-up bar never really got along. I'm 6'4", 230. You know, every SEAL going through training that has something that they're terrible at. You know, and so how do you lean into the things you're, you're, you're terrible at when you want to improve them? And, um, and how do you think about you know, the, the what you're trying to go achieve? No one expects you to have these answers, so please, no pressure. All I'm trying to give you is food for thought that will apply, that will help you in this process of, um, of not just your job now, but if you rewind this tape and listen to this three years ago, three, three years later or seven or 10 years later, I promise you that this, this framework thing that I'm talking about or some of this advice will, will be very, very relevant at any point. I do a lot, busy people always mentor. You know, the, the, you have to give back. And so I don't care how busy someone is. Look, I help run a Fortune 200 company. That's not a, that's, I'm not, no better than anybody else, but I'm a busy person. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I love to slow down. I love to make sure that we give back. And the thing that I would, would push on you guys is the, the pay it forward concept of like, as people invest in you, think about at your stage of life, how about the 11th grader who's get, thinking about going to Holy Cross? 
how, you know, how, how about mentoring that person? Those are people who can very much benefit from, from your wisdom. You have way more recently and better navigated the Holy Cross admission process than all the people who didn't get in and all the people who are old like me. You know, and so you are the most relevant people on the planet to talk about that. So just know what you're good at and what you can give back to the universe and, and, and then do it. Don't just be a beer, be a doer. So maybe that's a great place to close is don't just be somebody who to, to be something. Figure out what you want to go do and do it in harmony with the rest of the citizens of the United States and the world. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the talk, guys. Glad to go to Q&A or whatever else. Uh, thank you uh, for all your advice. Uh, my question is focused on your first theoretical point of how uh, success is based on excellent people by knowing they will never be excellent. Uh, what advice along no, the, knowing they'll never knowing you're never excellent enough? Excellent enough. Yeah, so, yeah. Excuse me. Um, what advice do you have in regards to this realization you'll never be excellent enough of not allowing it to like succumb a person um, into like depression, for example? That's a great point. The um, the, the whole point is wrapped, the whole, it's a great question, the point that I'm trying to get together is the hunger, the determination, the drive, the work ethic. Look, at the same time, you can't be, you have to remain positive and optimistic that, um, that whatever, whatever you're choosing to go do, or excuse me, that whatever you're not, can't enter a cycle of negativity and, and spin you out of control. There is more in life that we aren't than we are. Okay, so you have to have realistic goals. I'm probably not going to play in the NFL. You know, as much as I'd like to play in the NFL, I'm probably not. I'm 47 years old, and I'm I'm um, I, I could probably play, but no, but the, the, uh, no, no. It's, the uh, the um, so it's a you raise a great point, which is not to let like have healthy. You, let me say your point differently. Have healthy pressure, don't have unhealthy pressure. So whatever, and, and the only person that's going to know where that line is between healthy and unhealthy pressure is you. It's when my daughter has gone to school every day for the last whatever, she turns 18 in a couple days. And um, when she goes to school, and um, actually very proud to say she'll be a freshman next year. So, um, and the thing that I left out is also uh, a long legacy of Holy Cross folks here. I could tell you a great story about me sitting here in 11th grade with my grandfather and father talking about what Holy Cross meant to them, but that's a whole separate story someday. And my great grandfather, who's in the Varsity Hall of Fame for who held the, the record for the most points scored in a game until a guy named basketball game until a guy named Bob Cousy broke his record. And, uh, and also uh, b baseball also played for the Pirates. But anyways, the, um, the um, see, I even distracted myself. Healthy versus unhealthy. The thing is, is, it's your mind needs to make that up. When my daughter has gone to school, I've always told her, make it a great day. I don't say have a great day. Have is a passive verb. The world is going to happen to you or you're going to happen to the world. And so that mindset that I have is I'm going to make it a great day. There's no one that can make me have a bad day except for me. All of you and the rest of the world can try. I'm the only person that can let me have a bad day. And it's that mental strength of, of figuring out again, how do you want to be and what do you want to let get into your head? Look, man, I've had terrible days. I've cried like a, a, an absolute, cried my eyes out at the loss of many friends. You know, I'm um, a good friend of mine who was killed two years ago uh, in Somalia. And uh, you know, my wife and I were at his wedding in, in the late 2000s and one of my very, very close friends. And I'm bringing his son to the Super Bowl uh, on Saturday. And, um, and or fly down Saturday and, and, and you know, Tom Brady spoke at my friend's uh, memorial and, um, and his son who's, who's seven is absolutely convinced that, that his dad was in heaven helping Tom, you know, beat the chiefs. That's what he said after the game. And so like, these are the things in life that are, are, you know, you, you have really gotten me down at times, but the thing is you have, you have a two choices. When you go through really hard things, you can either let it spin you negatively and out of control or you can take, you can say, okay, I can only control what I can control. And how do I do the absolute best that I can learn from the situation and contribute and impact the rest of the world through whatever I've learned. That's always the path I take. Sure. I have hard days or whatever, but the, the point you raise is one of, of mental strength and things are only going to get you in the, ne the negative spot. If you let them, that's my main point. So you mentioned finding different uh, triggers and levers in terms of supporting people. Uh, as a leader, how do you go about finding these different triggers and levers? And the follow-up then being, how do you apply um, 
very different triggers and levers to people performing the same task? That's a great question. A really insightful um, question too, maybe deeper than you realize, but it's the, 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 the quick answer is by just learning about people. Not thinking about life as a transaction, but actually learning the people you work with and talk good old fashioned things called conversations without iPhones and Instagram and Snapchat and blah, blah, blah. Like, hey, but, but learning, hey, what are, you, what are your, your goals? What are you trying to achieve? Where do you, want to, where do you see yourself in, in a year or three years? And you know, anybody who we want starts talking about a long-term vision, I'll tell you that they're either wrong or they're lying. Nobody knows what the hell they're gonna do in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. All you can do is continue to build the foundation. My life looks, my resume looks very strange. You know, SEALs for 20 years, you know, White House sprinkled in there, hedge fund, a technology firm. A lot of people are like, you make no sense. And I would totally agree. But the thing that I will tell you that's common is that I've always leaned into hard situations, the, the hardest situation I can find, and, um, and rolled my sleeves up and either done things well or poorly, but in all cases learned. And so it, it, and along the way, I've always, always, always recognized that success comes from the people that are around you and, team, and, and life is a team sport. And so how do you get the best team members and how do you, um, how do you end up um, you know, really understanding what makes them tick? It's, it's just asking them. And um, through the surface area of contact that you have with people, whatever that is, try to make it larger and try to make it deeper and gather data points along the way and synthesize the data points. You know, I know that's a very abstract theoretical thing, but the simple, simple answer is just um, basic friendship and care. So you had a diverse experience, as you said, on your resume in your entire life. Um, I think that in a way, like being a part of the SEALs definitely helped you to do whatever you wanted to after you finished your tour of duty. So if, and not all of us are gonna be SEALs, so if we had a feeling, you know, five, 10 years from now, that thing we are doing right now isn't what we want to end up doing, how would you suggest like pivoting from an industry to an industry? It's a great, I'm glad you raised that. It's, it's building the foundation. Like I said, you have your whole life to build your foundation. You can build the walls and the roof later. I'll worry about my walls and roof when I'm in my 70s or 80s or 90s. The, the elemental learning that I'm talking about is the intrinsics. Look, I've interviewed literally hundreds, probably more than a thousand people for, for really important, high paying jobs. Um, the thing that I look for is not the skills of like, hey, I know how to go do this spreadsheet or I know how to go acquire this company or I know how to, how to you know, jump out of a plane. I look for the intrinsics. That ties back to the Jesuit liberal arts education, by the way. But the, the intrinsics matter the most. If you said you could, give me, you could give me the person who's the smartest on a topic or the person who is the most agile and can react the quickest, I'll take the reactor over the intelligent person any day of the week because that's going to be the more valuable skill. And the reactor is the person who can see, the, see a, a broad range of what's going on and then figure out what to go do. The, um, a, a corollary to what you're saying is, um, is what I would describe as the kind of the paradox of confidence and humility, right? Is it, a lot of people think confidence and humility are on one axis. You're either, you're either really confident or you're humble. False. They're on two axes. You know, con there's, there's degrees of confidence and there's degrees of humility. And so how do you live life in the confident and, and humble quadrant? It's, it's hard, right? But, you're, um, but it's very, very doable. Because I'm a very confident person. There, I've, I've, I know that I've done a lot of things in life that very few people can do. And, and, I, and because of the fact that I've been in situations that no one could foresee and I've reacted well and thought well and led well or, or, and made mistakes and learned, et cetera, I, when, when situations hit me, I feel like I'm one of the, most, the best equipped people. That can sound very arrogant. I don't mean it to sound that way. That's just, I'm a confident person. But I also know what I don't know. I also, the most important skill in all of this is knowing what you don't know. So that when something pops up that I don't know, I have a great network of people I can call. Now, the things that I actually know and lead on are infinitesimally small when compared to the rest of the universe of all the things that can happen. Right? I like to say that on any given topic, all I have is varying levels of ignorance on the topic. I stole that from a friend of mine, I love it. I love that statement. Varying levels of ignorance on everything. And, if, and that's the humility. 
The humility is coming into a room and saying, hey, there is always somebody in every room who is smarter, faster, and stronger than I am. How do I draw out? How do I find the person who's stronger? How do I find the person who's faster, smarter, and draw them in and find the, the best and the strengths of? So what I'm getting at here is really a, a talk around the intrinsics, right? Because so as you go from industry to industry, man, industry doesn't matter. The world thinks industry matters, but if you're really ready to run something and do something, you could put, you could put a, a person with great intrinsics in charge of you know, the, the seals, uh, you know, trading markets, uh, technology services, or making paper clips. That person's gonna figure it out because they know what they know, they know what they don't know, and they know how to build the teams and get to the answer. So when you say switching industries, it's not as big of a deal, I believe, as the world, um, as the world may think. That said, when you're thinking about your careers and your choices, recognize that the world looks at two things. There are two elements of a career, I think. There's, um, not to confuse you, if kind of phases earlier, but there's two elements right now. There's substance and there's perception. The, um, there's the substance is what you actually know and what you actually have in you. And the perception is what the world thinks you know. Both of them you need to think about in isolation and manage both of those in honest ways. Um, you know, I was, I, I'm not out in the universe looking for other roles. I just, I was asked to come into a, a uh, I, I don't even want to, I would be embarrassed to say out loud, like even how significant of a thing it is and how well it's paid. And, um, and it's funny, I sat there with the leader of this organization who, um, and said, I think when you look at my resume, I think you think I'm way smarter than I am. I don't know nearly enough to, they found me. They asked me to come in, I said, no, I'm good. And they're like, no, 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 please just trust us, just come in and have a conversation. I'm in the city all the time, so I was like, okay, I'll just come in for an hour. And, and I said, look, it, it almost disarms people when you're like, I actually don't know nearly enough to do this role. It's the same thing that when I applied, uh, when I was selected as a White House fellow, after, and we all need, we need Holy Cross to know this program way better because after you do a graduate degree, we need, I think that we need more Holy Cross grads in this White House Fellows uh, program. We can talk about that separately. But um, the, um, after you're selected, you basically get pulled into a variety of different um, parts of the executive branch, and you're gonna be placed at a very atypically senior role at, for your, I'll say age, your seniority, whatever it is. The fellows are like 28 to 34 kind of range, 26 to 34, something like that. But um, I had 10 different options in a bunch of great places in the executive branch, one of which was the National Security Council, which you, know, you heard that I landed at. The, uh, there, I met uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor who said, hey Mike, you know, I'm really interviewing two other very real people who've been in DC their whole lives, who know this business, who, you know, what, what in the world, you know, what part of this role is responsible for everything nuclear weapons for the nation? For example, the START Treaty is expiring soon. And um, what do you know about the START Treaty? And I said, well, I know how to spell it. Dead, like dead serious. I was like, I know how to spell it. I don't have a freaking clue. But you know what? Three weeks later, I was running meetings in the White House Situation Room with a group of Washington, D.C. experts who, um, who, knew, who knew everything about the START Treaty. I just needed to make sure the process ran well. And so, you know, the, uh, three weeks later, I wouldn't say I was an expert, but I knew a lot more about legal structures of, of treaties, about, you know, telemetry of rockets, of I could give you five other things that I learned, but I was also very comfortable standing in front of these, these folks in DC and, um, and telling them that, hey, I, I really don't know the subject matter here, but what I'm really good at is keeping that door closed and, and, um, and, and not letting anybody out of this room until we compromise and figure it out. And um, I could give you lots of Washington DC experiences and life lessons as well that apply to the real world, whether more experiences uh, um, on what not to do than what to do, but uh, our founding fathers made the, made the world, made, the, made our democracy intentionally hard to progress. But, uh, but anyways, I'm going on way too long on a very short question, but I think there's so much wrapped into it. There's so much depth into the question that it's really important to think about it from so many angles. So my headline or my bumper sticker response is, don't worry about the industry, worry about intrinsics. Uh, Mr. Reeves, thank you for your service to our country, um, and also thank you for speaking with us today. Um, just a quick question, what was the exact moment where you decided that you wanted to become a Navy SEAL? What motivated you? Um, I understand you said uh, you were at a Jesuit retreat house. Did you feel like you had uh, 
like I'm practicing Catholic. I don't know if you had uh, like a, a moment, like a feeling. Was there anything? Well, I know it's a personal. No, I'm glad I'll share anything, um, it, it, almost anything, as long as it's, you know, not secret, top secret material from my past that'll land me in jail. The, uh, <laughs> um, the, I did a lot of thinking, like I said, at the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the week where you're, you're, you're quiet and, and, uh, you know, going into my senior year being in ROTC, I had to decide, you know, I'm the oldest of four. I took it, I wasn't dying to be in the Navy. Um, you know, my, uh, my grandfather was in the Navy. My father was in the Navy. They never pushed it on me. I just was aware that there was a way to pay for school for four years as the oldest of four. I wanted to keep optionality for my younger three siblings to be able to go to school. And, um, um, all of whom came here, by the way, the, um, the, uh, and so I was like, okay, worst case, I'll do, I'll do four years in the military and then go off and do whatever I want to go do. I had no idea where life would take me, even, like, even through my junior year. Uh, the summer between junior and senior year, you need to figure out what, you know, you, you do a little three-week thing with the military. I, was, um, I flew on a jet off of an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean, and I was in like Italy and Palma, Spain, which... I won't even talk about those parties if we are still rolling tape, but, um, but uh, crazy awesome life. And I was like, man, these pilots are really super cool. I want to be a pilot because of the community that I saw, the people, the quality of the people, the adventurism, the, the cutting edge you know, mentality, the best of the best mentality, et cetera. Well, then I did three weeks of what, of what we called mini BUDS. BUDS is basic underwater demolition SEAL training. And, um, and I got a taste of like the real SEAL training for three weeks between junior and senior year. And man, it sucked. It was really, really hard. And I came back to campus saying to myself, man, I got a hard decision to make. So I took it down to the elemental level. If you think about pilot and SEAL, which by the way, I hope you're hearing a metaphor for just whatever choices you're making here, because you're right, you, you may decide you're never gonna be a SEAL, but the thing is these, it's the process of decision making and um, that, that matters. And so for me, the elemental thing of a, being a pilot was man versus machine, and a seal is man versus self. For me, I'm much more of a man v self, and also um, there's a variety of doing something differently all the time. As a pilot, you're constantly driving a X thousand number of ton machine, and yes, always trying to, to fly it better and better and et cetera, but it's very much the same. It's, it's, that, it's almost like I said before, orchestrating bands or being a, a playing an instrument. Being a pilot is an instrument. I didn't think of it the same way back then, but as I think about how my, I, I think about it now, I actually, you raised something that I've actually never really thought about, but that, that is playing an instrument. You know? And so when, now roll the, the clock forward to Afghanistan. I'm running all special operations in Southeastern Afghanistan. I've got not just SEALs, the 200 SEALs from SEAL Team 2 that I commanded, but 1,800 other people from Army, from all different services. I've got you know, vehicles, planes, helicopters, every element of everything that, that our nation has in combat. All I was responsible for it. And so that is conducting a band. And so as a SEAL, I grew up not being good at any one thing, but being good at how do you stitch the whole thing together? How do you have the vision, you know, the where you're going, the strategy, how you're gonna get there and the execution. And so that for me was what was important to me. The most important thing is that you do the thinking around what motivates you, um, and, but, but really do the, the why. Ask, keep asking yourself why until you can't answer why anymore. Your question can start really big. It's gonna get smaller. Your question will get smaller. Keep going why until you can't answer it anymore. 